we, we're talking with Peter DeVries, cinematographer, um, and you've become something of an expert lately in DSLR cameras. And uh, what's, your, what's your state on, <laughs> expert. Um, on those and other new camera formats and, and uh, approaches? Well, there's, there's no, no doubt that, that DSLRs changed everything. Um, you can almost put your finger on the date, which was, I think, September 2008 when 5D Mark II came out. Um, it was always going to be a transition phase, like the fact that the Mark, the Mark II had this amazing HD uh, ability was kind of almost accidental and um, everyone couldn't believe the quality and, and, and the uptake was staggering as we know. And there's, so there's a lot of 5D Mark IIs out in the marketplace, but the thing is that the industry has actually moved on from DSLRs, is moving on very rapidly now with camera manufacturers making large sensor cinema, um, cinema tools for people that are, are far better um, to use, far easier to use, um, and sort of at the same, same price point without having to spend so much money making it usable, which is one of the biggest issues that people have with the extra money they have to spend with the DSLR. Having said that, the, the thing with the 5D Mark II was just the extraordinary colour, the, the, the resolution, the giant uh, sensor that gave that amazing uh, depth of field that everyone just fell in love with. And it's really hard to give that up because the industry's kind of, kind of settled on, on a smaller size sensor, like a Super 35 style sensor, instead of opting for the big 36 by 24 sensor that, that is in the 5D. But to a large extent, I, I think the transition stage between um, DSLRs, that the DSLR is, we are, we are moving to much, much more interesting and much easier to use cameras now. So we're seeing now proper video cameras with that kind of larger sensor and the same kind of look that the 5D has? Well, to a large extent, yes. I think the thing is that people have become so wedded to the, the look of the, the 5D because it, because for, for, the, for the money you pay, the, the, the image quality is just absolutely superb. Um, Canon have just nailed it when it came to the processing, the, the, the way that they handle the processing and that massive amount of data not massive because it's pretty he heavily compressed as everyone is aware of however um, it was just a, just the right combination at the right time and I think everyone else is, I don't think we'd see other manufacturers making large sensor cameras had it not been for that particular camera but so to a certain extent it's still king of the castle but I think we are it, it was always going to be a transition phase where people would hold up a video a stills camera and shoot video and it was never going to last um, I'm not saying it's the end of the line, but we're certainly seeing some very interesting products from uh, Sony and Panasonic now using the same size sensor, which are really, really easy to use and, and take a variety of, of really good lenses as well. Well, the, the other video camera that's really taken a lot of that, um, that market and, and learned from that lesson of Canon's was the Red, yeah, I think, yeah. and now they've got the new Red Epic. So what's your experience with those ones? Um, well, look, I have, I've been to a couple of talks um, in regard to the, the, the Epic, um, but I don't know a hell of a lot about it. Or the Red One, at least. Oh, the Red, yeah. Well, that's been out for quite some time now. Um, it's Look, there's still a marketplace. That, that's still, a, I think, a really strong contender. There's a lot of Red cameras being sold, and um, so people aren't going to abandon Red because they of something new that comes out. That, that That's kind of in a, in a little class of its own. Although I think the Alexa uh, over here has probably taken a little bit of the wind out of the sails of that camera because again, you know, eighty thousand uh, US dollars, um, probably less than that actually for an Alexa. Um, and what's so special about this camera? Uh, the Alexa is, is wins hands down on ease of use and design. It is just absolute simplicity. Industrial design is just superb. It's solid. It's metal. Uh, it takes you. 15, 20 minutes to learn how to use the camera. Everything is just controlled on a side panel. Just touch the screen, just, just push the buttons very, very simply. You don't have to delve into deep into menus to find things. It's, it's, a, it's a, a, a dream camera. You set your exposure index and you start using it with a light meter. You forget about all the menus and you use it like a film camera. It's basically simple, you set it up and you start shooting. So we don't want to um, turn customers away because of complex menus. We want to make it very simple and easy. The menu structure is basically two levels. Most of it, what you see on the home screen is what you need. It's like exposure index, 
frame rate, shutter angle, white balance, and you can roll the camera. Well, let me ask a few stupid questions. What's the full resolution? Is it a 2K camera or 4K? This is basically a 3K sensor. It's the same sensor technology we use on the Iris scan. It's a similar sensor that we used already on the Ariflex D21. It's a 3K by 2K sensor. In this case, it's a 16 by 9 sensor readout. Right, and you but can do uncompressed out of it? You can do uncompressed, which is called Iri Raw, which you would record basically as an 844 signal, as a dual stream uncompressed to a codex or as two onboard recorder. So what's the, what are the built-in codecs if you the, do want a compressed image? If you want a compressed image, it's basically ProRes, where we have the choice of 444, 12-bit, 422HQ, 422, 422Lite and 422Proxy. Okay, does, that, does that mean you require Final Cut to edit this? Is a ProRes codec available on other platforms, do you know? Uh, you get Final Cut to, to basically playback, but any QuickTime reader can playback. Any PC or Mac uh, can can uh, or PC, uh, yeah can play back. Okay, so the ProRes codec you're using are all it's built into QuickTime. Yes, this Mac. is this is industry standard. Yeah, mm -hmm. we only adapt to what Apple already developed and what Apple, what what they're using for Final Cut Pro, and we just use this codecs because it's a highly sophisticated codex. For yes. cinematography, of course, we mainly use 444 or 422 HQ. These are two codecs which you use. In, in our case, which gives you up to 20 minutes recording time. There may be applications where you need one of the lower resolution codecs. For example, if you record Ari Raw on board, you want to use this only for offline, then you can also use 4 to 2 light. So what's the recording medium? The recording medium is on the other side. It's going to flash memory or hard drive? No, it's SPS cards. Yeah. Right. It's a Sony, it's currently a 32 gig card, which records up to 540 megabit per second. This hosts about 20 minutes of footage. This is the built-in, and you can have additional onboard recording from S2 or Codex, or Sony on tape, or you can go straight to a studio environment, to a routing switcher, or live to screen, whatever you need. It's been one of your contentious issues, I think, for most professional cinematographers, yeah. the complexity of these cameras these days. Yeah. So yeah. you're finding this one yeah, it's still approachable but very easy to use. Yeah, that's it. yeah. I think the, the, the biggest selling point, apart from the image quality, I mean, it's, it's a very, very solid camera in the, in the, um, the same sort of um, family of the, the German Araflex cameras. It's got that beautiful, solid build about it. Um, it, it look, it, it's just a beautiful camera. Everyone just falls in love with it. Even <laughs> before they even turn it on, they just love it. It's got a funky viewfinder, high, very. I keep looking over at it. I mean, it's just, it's just a beautiful camera. But the, the images are just beautiful. Everyone's in love with it. Everything fits on it. All the, all the, um, the matte boxes, follow focus units, everything just, just connects to it perfectly. The red is still a bit unwieldy. Um, it still looks like a, a daddy long leg spider when it's all decked out um, and so it's actually quite complicated to, to, to take say from, from a handheld rig uh, sorry the red in a handheld configuration and put it on a tripod is not an easy thing to do whereas the um, the Alexa and, and to a certain extent the, the Sony F3 at the kind of lower end of the big sensor market is also a very easy camera you know, for almost a one man band type of camera I actually saw some footage from the recent NAB where they were actually showing, I think it was a 4K camera, doing HDR. Do you see HDR being a, a revolutionary new process for, for video production, film production? Um, look, I think it's got, it's got potential. The whole, the whole point of it is to bring it into the, the, the range that film once occupied in terms of dynamic range. Um, it's one way of doing it. Um, one would have thought that it would be better to actually make a, a processor and uh, video technology to actually uh, embrace the full range of highs to lows, brightness to darkness. HDR is a kind of a cheap way of achieving that by virtually shooting two, I think it's like two images simultaneously, isn't it? Two or three, And, yeah. and, and overlapping. Um, I would have hoped that, that the solution to limited dynamic range would actually come more from uh, within chip technology mm. Um, I don't know, I, I, I use HDR on my iPhone, because I shoot, I, um, you know, on the iPhone you can shoot HDR and regular, yeah. you can have the option. O often the HDR looks horrible. Well, I know a lot of stills photographers love the HDR that they could do with that, yeah. and the kind of images that they can get with that, and just wanting 
Yeah. I'm imagining some very creative uses of it in video once we get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think I think it's going to take a bit of sweetening to get it to work well. Um, I just unsure how how it would manage in a dynamic situation, but um, look, I don't think anything is going to solve massive problems for people if they don't light it or, or take into consideration designing or designing a shot where a person walks from here to here. You have to be just mindful of the difference in light. I think dynamic uh, HDR is not going to be the big saviour uh, of every situation. I think there'll, there'll be time. There'll always be times when you need to just think, well. I need to read, I need to cut this shot into two bits rather than try and do it in one. Because I think the HDR, it's, it's not going to cope with everything. But it, I think it might save you the, you know, bringing out the neutral density grad filters uh, every now and again. Can I also ask you, you know, given your work, the plethora of codecs and file formats that we have to deal with <laughs> these days in video production? Yes. How do you deal with it as a cinematographer? Um, I usually ask people like you, <laughs> what's going on. Um, well, I, I, I really um, just try and read as much as I can about it. I talk to a lot of people um, about what the different codecs do. Uh, I, to, to a large extent, I don't have a full appreciation and understanding about how they work. Um, I, I do you know, think it's a cinematographer's responsibility or more post-production to understand all of that? No, I think as a cinematographer, I think you have to be aware of this because you have to really configure the camera. It's like putting the film stock in the camera. You, you, that's your call. Um, am I going to put in uh, Fuji film or, or am I going to put in Kodak, high speed? Really, I think that that's going to affect so much have an influence on your overall result. I don't think you can just um, palm that off to someone. I think you have to make a decision about um, which, which codec is going to work in post. You, you have to be very careful that you don't shoot in a way which is going to complicate things in post. As a DOP, it's your responsibility to make sure that, that, that it's going to be a smooth workflow. You, you just cannot do what you want um, and just ignore the post-production. You've got to fit in with how it's going to work. So questions have to be asked before you hit the, hit the record button. So with that in mind, instead of choosing Fuji or Kodak film, in this case, like choosing one camera over another because they have different codecs, choosing the red over a Sony, over an Arri. Yeah. Uh, so you would, because you like the colour that the red does, the, yeah. the way that looks for this project, that would be more suitable, or for this one, I'll choose a Sony camera. Is that what you would you would do? Well, the actual, like, you can actually bring, all those cameras that you mentioned are all capable of shooting in the, I think uh, you can record in a, in a ProRes 422 or probably uncompressed format. So um, I don't know how much influence that has on the overall colorimetry um, settings. I, I think you can bring everything down to 422 and th th thereby you can use all those formats um, and they'll all be much the same. Okay, so from your point of view, the format that the camera is isn't that important uh, as opposed to the lenses and other factors, perhaps? No, look, well, I guess, what I, I, guess what, I, what I would say is I'm more concerned about lenses. I'm more concerned about um, uh, other aspects, hardware, if you like, hardware. What sort of hardware I'm going to use? But I think, Phil, the question has to be asked at some stage before you start. You need to have a little meeting with the, with the producers and the director and the editor and say, "How I'd like to shoot this on the Alexa. I'd like to shoot uncompressed uh, Arri Raw." And people might just roll their eyes and think. Well, we don't know anything about Arri Raw. Uh, can we shoot Arri? Well, okay, we, we could go 422 and, and just shoot ProRes 422 and just deliver it straight into Final Cut Pro. That's another option. That's a very easy way to do it. Um, but that's what I mean. The question, you have to sort of work out what you're going to do. Once that decision's made, that's great. You do, it's, not a, it's not a big thing to think about. The, 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 the important things that come then, okay, how are we going to move the camera? Are we going to move the camera? What lenses are we going to use on? Are we going to shoot with primes? Are we going to shoot with zooms? Um, shall we get digi primes? Well, how much can we afford? It comes more down to the look of the camera. I think once you, t t there's so much focus on, on, on software and numbers and codecs that it can detract from the, the, the pure art of cinematography. Uh, you, you've, I think as a cinematographer, you have to be aware of it, but I think at some stage you've just got to make the decision and then just get stuck into shooting and lighting. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. That's the answer I was looking for.